a lot of rulings to learn from it. That a person have taken oath not to say it, but he did not take an oath on staying silent about it. So there are ways of finding out through that. Khalid As-Simti rahimahullah says that there was a judge. Khalid As-Simti was a muhaddis of his time, but he, used, he was one of the 40 people in that committee that Imam Muhanifa rahimahullah formed. So he said once, uh, there were two judges over there who did not like Imam Muhanifa at all. One was Qadi ibn Abi Layla, and the other was Qadi Shubruma. Once Qadi ibn Abi Layla was going somewhere and he said, I was with Imam Muhanifa rahimahullah, we were also going for a walk. There were some people there who were in the park and there were some women singing. So when they passed by those women, the women saw that it's the Qadi, it's the judge, and this is Abu Hanifa, two great people are coming. So at least this much haya was there in those days. Then they stopped singing. Now, as they got close to them, Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah said, that was very nice. And they went. Qadi ibn Abi Layla asked someone to file a case where he would say, Imam Abu Hanifa is the witness. Imam Abu Hanifa will be my witness. And I will call him to the court. I want to talk to him about it. So someone filed a case where he said, Imam Abu Hanifa is my witness. Now Imam Abu Hanifa, as a witness, he had to go there. Qadi ibn Abi Layla asked him the situation. He said, are you the witness? He said, yeah, this person asked me to witness for it. Your witness is rejected. SubhanAllah, the rejected witness of such a great person rejected. He said, yes. That day me and you were walking. Those women were singing. And you told them that it was nice. <laughs> so you agree to the sin. And you encourage them to that sin, telling them it was nice. So he asked him, did I say this was nice? When they, after they stopped, or while they were singing. He said, after they stopped. So mind think, you know, I was telling them it was nice that they stopped singing. <laughs> Not the singing itself. It's stopping to sing when they saw us, it was nice of them. And Qadi ibn Layla had to accept the witness. These type of understanding, explanation of understanding, and uh, really, it... It shows what type of intellect the person has. Once Ibn Abi Za'idah was another muhaddis. He says, the ruling came to the fuqaha of that day and to muhaddisin, that if a person has a glass with some silver on some side of it, now drinking in pots made out of silver, glass made out of silver is not allowed. But, how about if there is just a very little silver on some portion of it where you don't touch it, where you are not going to put your lips on it, just a small portion of it has silver on it. Is it allowed to drink from that glass? So many of them said because it's generally silver, so it should be allowed. Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah's fatwa was, uh, it, it's not allowed, uh, general ruling was, it's not allowed. Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah gave the fatwa that this was allowed. They asked him, where did you get this from? He said, from a hadith. <clears throat> there is no hadith about this. But I heard it. How can you hear a hadith that all the muhaddisin don't know about? He says, do you know that it says in the hadith, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to wear a ring made out of silver? Yes. And then it says in the hadith that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam drank the water, there was no uh, pot or anything, so with his hand he drank the water. Yes, that is there. So ring is in his hand, and he's drinking water using his hand as a pot. So a small portion of a glass has that small uh, silver on it. Subhanallah, see the understanding. Where a person would ever think about it? That that hadith refers to this ruling. During those days, another issue came up. People sitting in the masjid, 
and a snake came and fell on a person. It was on a, was walking or going on a roof of the masjid, and it fell on one of the people. This person, to save himself, he quickly threw the snake away, and it got into onto the next person. The second person was afraid, and he threw the snake away, so it got into the third person. The third person threw it away, it got into the fourth person, <laughs> and fourth person was bitten by the snake and died. A big question now, that who should pay the ransom for it? There is dia. There is a ransom that has to be paid. But who should pay? All three, or the first person, or the third person who threw it on the fourth one. And discussion started amongst the fuqaha, amongst the muhaddisin, among the scholars. Some of them are saying the fourth, the third person because he's the one who threw it on the fourth. Some of them are saying that the first person because he started it. Some of them are saying that all three were part of it, so all three should do it. But what is the reason? Tell us some solid proof. None. You know, Abu Hanifa rahimahullah, when they had that Ja'far al-Mansur, this was the good thing about those khulafa, that these type of uh, important issues, they right away, they used to call all the fuqaha and all the muhaddisin in one gathering. All of you sit and decide. You know, Abu Hanifa rahimahullah said, that my understanding is, that the, it depends. It may be that none of them has to pay the ransom, and it may be that the third person has to pay it. The first two are out of it anyway, because when the first person had it on him, he threw it on the second person. Nothing happened to the second person. So the first person is out of the situation. His act is over. Second person threw it on the third one. Nothing happened to the third one. The second person is out of the situation. Third one threw it on the fourth person. Now, did the fourth person have enough time to throw it away? If he did, if he did, then the third person is not responsible because that person was negligent. And he did not take care of it himself. He let it be there until that snake did what it had to do. And if the third person did not get the chance, and people are saying, really, I mean, it was right away, then the third person will have to pay the ransom for it. All the fuqaha and muhaddisin agreed about it. And it became the rule. Qadi ibn Abi Layla gave the issue, the ruling in the court about it. So it was the rule that was issued. These type of situations that tell us that the understanding that when we talk about fiqh, what is fiqh? This will tell us what is fiqh. This is the reason I'm mentioning these examples. So we understand, because many times when we say fiqh, 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 we don't know what is fiqh. We don't know what is understanding. One thing that, if a person will say that interest is halal, he's faqih. That is the fiqh. That something haram, make it halal. But this is the understanding. This is what shows that these people really studied it. They are having a deep look at the ayahs of Al-Quran and the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and through their taqwa, through their devotion to this knowledge, through their practice of this deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed them with that type of understanding. And it wasn't only him. There were other people who had it. We are only talking about him at this time. But it was an extremely deep understanding. For example, similar type of situation happened in the time of Imam Bukhari rahimahullah, where a question came, is the hair of a human being Najis or Tahir? Is it clean or Najis? And of course, there was discussion about it. Imam Bukhari rahimahullah answered that in his book, Sahih al-Bukhari. But, if I tell you today, go back and use all of your computer softwares that you can find, and use whatever understanding you have of it, and any book you can find about it, to find that answer, you will not be able to find the answer in Sahih al-Bukhari. I'm guaranteeing you that. You won't be able to find it, whereas the answer is in Sahih al-Bukhari. Imam Bukhari has given the answer. Where? 